Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar in its new home on my Gordon Ross homepage. Now I promised to keep on, keep going with the programs no matter what happened with Facebook. So here we are again in one of my strange evening broadcasts. Sorry, it's a bit of an odd one. I'm sitting in a local car park of a supermarket at the moment. However, there are a couple of things which I wanted to talk about tonight. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the Labour Party and Rachel Reeves in an interview with uh, Laura Koonsberg was talking about what Labour will and will not do if and when it becomes the new government of the United Kingdom. And I think it's pretty much uh, a certainty that the Labour Party will inherit the ashes, as it were, of the United Kingdom and its failed economy. But according to Reeves, Labour has no intentions of reversing any of the current uh, policies of the Tory party at all. And when I was listening to this interview and reading uh, transcripts of it afterwards, it dawned on me that the Labour Party is missing a colossal opportunity here to do some real good for the United Kingdom. To explain, well, let's take a, a step backwards in time to Britain post-war. Just after the Second World War, Britain was massively in debt and it was in debt to the rest of the world, basically, but it specifically had an enormous war debt owed to the United States, amongst others. The problem was that the war had basically cleaned out the coffers of the UK, left it with no money, massive amounts of debt, and an entire economy which was on a war footing had suddenly got to rebuild itself. Now, Clement Adley, who became the Labour Prime Minister post-war, had the foresight to hire a very good advisor, an economic advisor, uh, John, what was his name, uh, Keynes, if I remember the, the name correctly. However, Adley was wise enough to realise that you do not get out of a deep, dark recession by cutting spending in the way the Tories have been doing for the last 15 years. And in fact, the Tories have led to the current recession and Britain's unemployment rate is rising and businesses are failing and the economic outlook is getting worse. Adley realised that in order to get Britain moving again, it was actually better to invest in the nation. And what better way to do it than to take back into public ownership things which the people really, really needed. And so we saw the birth of the National Health Service, one of the, I think, the, the most craning achievements of, of the British state as it was after World War II. But not only that, Adley also nationalised the coal industry, the oil industry, the electricity industry, he nationalised coal mines, he nationalised the railways, basically took into public ownership everything that the people were to rely upon for their success in the coming years. And by investing and spending money in this way, the United Kingdom's economy boomed. Inflation actually disappeared overnight. And for many years, the United Kingdom enjoyed almost full employment all the way up to and including the 1960s. And this was effectively Labour's greatest triumph. Now Britain finds itself in another deep recession, um, with a war going on elsewhere, admittedly, this time, but with the British state and the British economy faltering and circling the drain. Now, Rachel Reeves could have said that the Labour Party would emulate uh, what Clement Attlee's government achieved post-war and reinvest in public utilities, take back under public control all of the national assets which used to belong to us, such as the electricity supply companies, the national grid, the entire railway network, um, the oil industry, which used to be owned by the United Kingdom under British Petroleum, for example, um, and also everything else which was sold off in the great Thatcher sell-off of everything that was worth anything. So, in doing so, in bringing back into public ownership everything that we lost, our energy bills could be reduced dramatically. Things like heating and lighting, electricity and gas could all be supplied at prices we could afford instead of seeing the 900% profits made by these massive corporations who've been ripping us off, all enabled by a Tory Chancellor and by the Tories appointed uh, regulators, Ofcom and Ofgem who have basically allowed these companies to ride roughshod over everybody, overcharge massively and profiteer on the backs of all of us. 
But the Labour Party is not going to do that. Rachel Reeves is making no promises, there's no money in the coffers, and according to her, all that's left over from the Tory administration is the crumbs of their breakfast. And that doesn't surprise me, because crumbs is precisely what the Labour Party will give to Scotland once it's real, well, once it's elected into Westminster. It's not going to do Scotland any favours. However, if Scotland wanted to emulate what Clement Attlee did in World War II in Scotland, we could do so. And we could do so quite simply by Scotland becoming independent and writing a new constitution which enshrines the sovereignty of the people in law. It already exists in Scots law. We are already a sovereign population, but most of us don't understand what popular sovereignty means. And so we turn to Switzerland, which has a form of popular sovereignty which has been going on for decades, and we all know how wealthy and successful Switzerland is, so they must be doing something right. Yep. So why couldn't Scotland do that? Well, that's exactly what it could do if the Constitution were written in such a way as to guarantee that the sovereign people of Scotland may make any decision which affects the entire nation. So if a government uh, elected in Scotland wanted to take a decision which would affect everybody nationally, it would have to go to a public referendum so that the people could decide whether or not they supported it. And in this way, we would be the ones who would decide what our future is. So if the Scottish Government were to say, oh well, we are not going to nationalise these national assets, these utilities and our rail infrastructure and so on, if they decided that, then we could just say, well, we're having a referendum then and we'll decide whether we nationalise these things. And then it would be us telling the government that they have to find the investment to do so. And that's exactly the way Switzerland works. And this is exactly the way that Scotland should work if our constitution and our guaranteed rights of sovereignty, which we already hold, were already enshrined. So we have a unique opportunity. If Labour fails us, which I anticipate they definitely will this year, then Scotland has always got another choice. We must have a referendum. We must decide our own future. We must adopt our own constitution, which outlines the limits of the powers of our government and also enshrines the power of the people to decide on uh, essential issues of national importance such as nationalisation of public utilities. And in this way we could build a country which is fit for the 21st century and drag ourselves out of the dreadful mess that the Tories have made out of the entire economy of these islands and extricate ourselves and come out of it as a wealthy, healthy nation which decides its own future and in which the people play a much bigger role. The people of Scotland have been depoliticised. We have been shut out of the actual mechanics of politics and decision making for so many years. We thought that we couldn't actually change things and yet we can. And I'm outlining to you tonight just exactly how that should work. And this is precisely what Salvo, what Sarah Solliers, what the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group and other groups have been fighting so hard for for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And my job on this programme of mine on IndyCar is to remind you that you have popular sovereignty. You do have the right to have a referendum. You do have the right to self-determination. And no, you don't need to ask Westminster's permission to do any of it. So that's it from IndyCar tonight. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's little rant and also the little history lesson from the ear of Clement Attlee. I'll be back again later in the week when I hope to bring you some more interesting information. It's not always about news, it's not always about debunking the BBC and the mythology coming out of the British press. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of what the truth is of our situation. And that is what I see my role as being at the moment. Anyway, I will be here as long as you need me. I'll mostly be broadcasting on this page from now on. So if you haven't seen me already on this page, please make a note, set the notifications, become a follower, make a friend request to this page, and I'll happily take you all on. Thank you for watching, and as usual, keep the faith. Remember, you can always donate using the link included in the description. I'll see you soon. Keep the faith. Bye for now.